Okay, so uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the third session of the Jews for Judaism Counter Missionary Survival Seminar. And this evening's program is called The Real Messiah, Part 2. And uh, I just want to very, very briefly summarize what we covered last week. Because tonight's uh, discussion is based upon last week's class. Uh, last week we really tried to understand what is the biblical concept of the Messiah. Uh, often people try to discuss, was Jesus the Messiah? Was this person the Messiah? Was that person the Messiah? And it's obviously a useless discussion unless you know exactly what a Messiah is. If you don't know what a Messiah is, there's no way of knowing whether someone is or isn't the Messiah. Right? You have to have clear definition. So what we saw last week was that the Bible does speak about many Messiahs, many people in Jewish history who were anointed with oil, they had oil placed on them, and that is the act of anointing. In Hebrew, the word anointing is Mashiach. So any person that was anointed would be called a Messiah, a Mashiach. And in the Bible we saw that kings were anointed, so David was a Messiah. Shaul, the first king of Israel, was a Messiah. We saw that the high priests, like Aaron, Moses' brother, was anointed. He was a Messiah. The Bible speaks about people that were prophets that were anointed. They were Messiahs. But the question is, does the Bible ever speak about a special Messiah, that it was going to come in the future. And because this Messiah is special, we call this one not just any Messiah, but the Messiah. And we saw last week that the Bible does speak about a special king who will rule, he will be the leader of the Jewish people in the future, and the Bible describes what that future will look like. We saw that the Bible spends a lot of time describing a new, different, better kind of world. For all of human history, the world has been broken. The world has been a place far from the ideal, especially for the Jewish people. We have suffered. We have been in exile. Uh, the world doesn't like us too much. And yet, the Bible says that one day, the Jewish people will return from their exile. We will all come back to live in our homeland. There will be peace for the Jewish people in their homeland. And we will be able to have our temple, which is now in ruins. And when that happens, all the Jewish people will return to following the Torah. The Bible speaks about the transformation of the Jewish people physically and spiritually. That we're going to return to God, we're going to return to our land, we're going to return to the Torah and to the commandments of the Torah. And the Bible says when that happens, the nations of the world are going to turn to us and ask us to teach them about God. So the Bible says that the knowledge of God will spread throughout the entire world. The Bible says every person on the planet is going to believe in God. And when that happens, there will be peace throughout the world. And the Bible says that at that time, there will be a wise and righteous king who will be a descendant of King David. And that is the Messiah. 
That person is the Messiah. And what is important to understand is that there isn't anything else in the Bible about a future Messiah who will come. That's all we have. The picture I just described. And so we know, based upon this understanding, that the Messiah has not yet come. Because again, to repeat, the Bible describes, the Bible emphasizes what the world will look like when the Messiah is here. The world does not yet look like that. The Messiah has not yet come. So we saw that the major reason why, the major reason why we understand that Jesus was not the Messiah is because none of the prophecies of the Bible were for, will fulfill, were fulfilled in his time. We saw, by the way, two other additional factors. One was that the Bible tells us something that will happen before the Messiah comes, which is that the prophet Elijah, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi, will return, and that didn't happen before Jesus. And we saw that there was no real proof that Jesus was a descendant of King David. The only proof there is, is the Christian Bible. But that would be like a person going to court and saying that someone owes him a million dollars, and the court says, can you prove it? And he says, I tell you right, that they owe me a million dollars. So the fact that the Christian Bible tells us that Jesus is a descendant of David does not prove it. It's not real proof. And we saw that not only is there no real proof that Jesus came from the line of David, we saw, actually, that there are many problems with the genealogy of Jesus. Many problems with his ichus. Uh, and we're not going to go into them again tonight. So that was last week's class. And what we want to do this week is begin to understand, so what do Christian missionaries say in response to last week's class? How do they answer this question? So, the major response of Christianity is to say that it's true, they agree, that Jesus did not fulfill any of those prophecies, but Christians insist, but Jesus will return. He will come back in the future, and when he comes back, he will do all those things the Messiah is supposed to do. That is what Christians call the second coming. The Messiah is going to have a second coming. Now one question we could ask tonight is, so why did he come the first time? And uh, we're not going to get into that tonight, maybe in a few weeks. But let's try to understand, what is our response? What is the Jewish response to this claim that the Messiah is going to come back after he dies without fulfilling any prophecies, and at some point in the future, now it's 2,000 years later, what is our response to this Christian idea that yes, Jesus was the Messiah, and we'll see that he will fulfill all of the prophecies when he returns. So we're going to share five points. Five points. Point number one. Point number one is that this idea is just a theory it's a claim, but it has no basis in the Bible. There's absolutely nothing in the Bible about the Messiah coming, and then failing, and then coming back thousands of years later. So it's a concept which has no basis in the Bible. Second problem. If you remember from last week, we had those two circles, the A circle, and the B circle, right? And the B circle were those about 10 passages in the Bible 
which spoke specifically about this descendant of David who will be the king when the world has been transformed into a paradise, into a utopia. So the problem is that if the Christians were right, those ten passages should be speaking about someone returning, someone coming back to be the king. However, when you read those passages in the Bible, they don't speak about someone coming back or returning. It has a perspective of the person coming for the first time. That's a second problem with this idea of the second coming. The third problem is that this idea of the second coming doesn't give Jesus any credibility for the first time he was here. What do I mean by this? You could say about anyone who was a failed Messiah that they will come back sometime in the future. It's what we would call a rationalization. We would say that, uh, as an expression, necessity is the mother of invention. That Christians were forced to say that Jesus will come back because he didn't accomplish anything. But the problem is, if they're saying that he will only fulfill the prophecies when he comes in the future, why should I believe, or why should any of us believe, that he is the Messiah now, before he fulfills all those prophecies? So the problem of a second coming is that there's no credibility for the first coming. Meaning that I could say about my great-grandfather, my great-grandfather was the Messiah. And you'll look at me and you'll say, really? What did your great-grandfather do? And I'll say, no, he, he was killed in Europe somewhere. But you'll see, when he comes back, he'll fulfill all the prophecies. So you would say, well, look, we'll wait till he comes back and then we'll talk. Right? But no one is going to start believing in my grandfather because I tell you one day he will come back and do amazing things. So this whole idea that Jesus is going to come back in the future, that doesn't give me any sense that I should believe in him now. And Christians are not telling us we should believe in Jesus when he comes back. They're saying that we have to believe in Jesus now. Fourth problem. The fourth problem is, and this is not so much our problem, this is really more of a problem for the Christians. The fourth problem is that in the Christian Bible, which speaks about Jesus coming back, it doesn't speak about him coming back in 2,000 years. It speaks about him coming back immediately, in that generation. For example, in one passage, Jesus says to his followers, there are some of you here standing today who will not taste death, meaning you will not die until I come back with the kingdom of God. So he was basically saying that the generation he was living in, that's going to be the generation that sees him return. Or in another passage, he says, this generation will not pass away until everything is fulfilled. Okay? In many passages in the Christian Bible, he says, I'm coming back soon. And this is repeated over and over and over again. So the problem here is that the, the concept of the second coming was not indeterminate. It wasn't something that could be put off for hundreds and thousands of years. In the Christian Bible, the second coming was supposed to be in that generation. And now, the fifth problem. The fifth problem is that there's one problem that cannot be remedied, it cannot be fixed by Jesus coming back. And that is, if there was a problem with his genealogy, if there was a problem with his family line, 
being traced back to David, that cannot be fixed even if he comes back a thousand times. Right? He cannot rewrite his genealogy. He cannot fix his uh, ancestry. And so if there was a problem with his genealogy the first time, it cannot improve by coming back. So those are five problems with this theory of the second coming. So what we're going to do now is try to understand what is the Christian case for Jesus. Meaning, how do they try to argue for their case, for their point of view? I'll, I'll give you an example, a story that happened to me a number of times. So I've had uh, many discussions with Christians, and they ask me, so why don't you believe in Jesus? And I give them the answer we've just learned. I say, well, the Bible has a description of what the Messiah will be, and Jesus does not fit the description. So one of the most common responses that Christians have is, yes, but what about all the miracles that he did? What about all the miracles that Jesus did? He walked on water. He healed people. He took uh, a few loaves of bread and a few fish, and he was able to feed many, many people. So they claim that he did many miracles. And their assumption is that those miracles would prove that he is the Messiah. My response, you know, Jews always answer a question with a question. So I ask this question. I ask them, tell me, how many times does the Bible tell us that we will be able to know who the Messiah is based upon all the miracles that he will do? A simple question. Again, if you remember what we did last week, we showed very clearly and consistently that the Bible has a description, a definition of the Messiah. So I ask them, tell me, how many times does the Bible tell us that the way we will be able to know who the Messiah is, is because he will do miracles? And they think, and they say, uh, I can't think of any places the Bible says that. And I say, that's correct. The Bible never says that we will know who the Messiah is based upon the miracles he will do. But I go further with them, and I ask, why is that? Why doesn't the Bible ever tell us that miracles will prove that someone is the Messiah? It's important to understand that. So, the reason is very simple. Because in the Bible we see that many kinds of people can do miracles, not just good people. For example, in Egypt, when Moses performed the ten plagues, actually God did them, but Moses was the, uh, you know, was, was, was the front man, Moses was the representative. So when those miracles were done in Egypt, and Moses was holding up the staff, or hitting the water with the staff, we know that the magicians of Pharaoh were able to do the exact same miracles, or at least some of them. In the Bible, God tells us that there will be false prophets, and these false prophets will be able to do incredible miracles. The Bible tells us it's going to happen. There will be false prophets, and they will be able to do amazing miracles. So the question is, if they are false prophets, why would God allow them, why would God give them the ability to perform miracles if they're false prophets? And the Bible says, this is the 13th chapter in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, the Bible says, because God will be testing us, God will be testing us to see, are we going to follow him? Or are we going to be impressed by the miracles of the false prophet? What's interesting 
is that I tell these Christians that in their Bible, it says the same thing. In the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 24, it says that false messiahs will be able to do incredible supernatural miracles. So now we ask the question, if a false messiah can do miracles, then could miracles any, ever prove that someone is the real messiah? Obviously not. Now, this whole discussion we just had was based upon the understanding that Jesus did miracles. But that's not so simple. Another question we could ask the Christian is, how do we know Jesus did any miracles? How do I know? And they would have to say, because the Christian Bible says so. And I would say, how convenient. But the question is, how do we know that those stories are true? Who wrote the New Testament? Who wrote the Christian Bible? Were they historians? Were they journalists? No. They were Christian missionaries. And in the Christian Bible, John, one of the writers, says, I am writing these stories to convince people to believe in Jesus. So, he has what we call a vested interest. He is someone who is not objective. He's not a historian. He's not a journalist. He's a salesman. He's trying to promote his beliefs. And the question is, would someone exaggerate stories, or invent stories if they're trying to convince people to believe in Jesus? Is it possible? So, I will share with you something interesting. Today, in the world, one of the ways in which missionaries try to promote their beliefs is by claiming that Christians have many miracles happen to them today. In many churches, they claim that in the churches, people get healed, people's lives get better. And the question is, are all of these stories true? So I have with me a magazine that was published by Christian missionaries. This is the organization called Jews for Jesus. And they have a magazine that's sent to their supporters, sent to the people that support them. And they write in here that they wanted to put together an issue of the magazine that discussed supernatural miracles and healings, people being healed. And they said that they asked all of their readers to send in stories of people who were sick, and there was a doctor who diagnosed that there was a sickness, and they were healed with a doctor diagnosing that there was a healing. And they say here that they were not able to receive any testimonies that were substantiated by a doctor to prove that there was a healing based upon the beliefs of Christianity. And what they say here is very interesting. They say, sadly, this type of experience is all too common. They said that there was a one person who claimed that it was their own doctor that was healed, but when the magazine contacted the doctor, the doctor said that he had no idea what they were talking about. And they say this is all too common, meaning that it's too common that people claim that there are miracles and there are no miracles. Then they go on to say that there was someone else who wanted to write a book about miracles in the church, and he did a lot of research, and again, remember, this is not someone who wasn't a Christian, that was a skeptic who was doing the research. This is a Christian who was trying to research miracles in churches, and he found 
in all of the stories that he researched, he said he found each of the instances where healing was claimed to be questionable. Not some of the stories, all of the stories he said were questionable. So, if today Christians would make up stories in order to convince people to believe in Jesus, it's quite possible that 2,000 years ago, the writers of the Christian Bible would also make up stories. But, uh, we'll take the questions later. I'm going to tell you two stories that happened to me. I once met a young man who was a Jewish person that converted to Christianity. And I asked him, why did he convert? Why did he convert from Judaism to Christianity? So he told me because he saw many miracles in his church. And I asked him to give me some examples. What are you referring to? He said, well, he said once he went into the service and his back was hurting him, his back was not feeling good. And after the service, his back felt much better. Very nice. He told me that he was driving in the car one day, and he was thinking of a song on the radio, and all of a sudden the song was played on the radio, it came up on the radio. And then he told me that he was once hungry, and he was in his friend's house, and there was no food, and he opened the cabinet, and there was cookies, and it was his favorite cookies. Those kind of stories. So I said, and that's why you believe in Jesus. That's why you converted. He said, yes, because of these kind of miracles. So I asked him, I said, do you believe that miracles can prove that a religion is true? And he said, yes, that's why I converted to Christianity. So I asked him, what do you do? How do you explain the miracles that I have seen? I asked him, if miracles prove a religion is true, how do you explain the miracles that I've seen? He said, you've seen miracles? I said, yes. He said, tell me what you've experienced. I told him two miracles, but I said I have many more. These are the two that I told him. When I was 27 years old, I was driving my car, and it went over a cliff. The car went over a cliff, the car flipped over about 10, 15 times, and the car was basically crushed flat, and I walked out without a scratch. It's true? Yeah, this is a true story. It happened to me. I was there. So I said, I think that's as big a miracle as your back feeling better. And then I said, when I was a student in Israel, my roommate's cousin was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. He was diagnosed with, basically he was going to, doctors said he would not be able to live. He had cancer in the brain, he had a tumor. And the whole school, my yeshiva, prayed for him, and he totally recovered. Now I told them those are two miracles that I've experienced, and I said I've seen many, many others. So I asked him if miracles prove a religion is true, I said, does that mean Judaism is true because of the miracles that I've seen? So he said to me, Rabbi Skobat, the miracles that you saw were done by the devil, by Satan, to confuse you. The miracles you saw were done by the devil to confuse you. Why? He said, because the devil, Satan, wants you to go to hell. How will Satan get you to go to hell? By keeping you away from Jesus. Remember, we learned the first week that Christians believe that if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell forever. So he said, the devil wants you to go to hell. And he will get you away from Jesus 
by performing all of these amazing miracles to keep you a loyal Jew. So if he keeps you a loyal Jew, you won't go to Jesus, you'll burn in hell forever. So I said, that's interesting. I said, do you believe that the devil runs all around the world doing miracles to confuse people? He said, of course, that's the devil's job. So I asked him, how do you know the devil didn't do those miracles to confuse you? How do you know that the miracles you saw weren't done by the devil to confuse you? And he got very confused by this question. Hmm. Okay, I'll tell you one more story. I was at a meeting of Christians, and these were mostly Jews that converted, and I spent time with one of them, and I asked him his story. How did he convert? And he told me that he had friends that were trying to convert him, and they were talking to him, and giving him things to read, and they were taking him to meetings, and he was thinking maybe he should convert, but then he said, but no, I'm a Jew, and I shouldn't convert. And he told me he was going back and forth and back and forth. He was very confused. He was getting very frustrated. Should I believe in Jesus? Should I not believe in Jesus? What should I do? He told me he got so frustrated that one day he said to God, God, I'm tired of going back and forth. He said, God, just tell me, should I believe in Jesus or should I not believe in Jesus? He told me at that moment, a lightning bolt came into his room, chased him all around the room, it went into his stomach, and came out of his head. So I said to him, you know, if that had happened to me, I would have thought God was saying no. I would have thought that was a no answer. Why are you assuming that God was telling you, yes, you should believe in Jesus? Now, that we see today in the world all religions have miracles. Christians have miracles. Jews have miracles. Every religion in the world can tell stories of miracles that happen to them. So, it's obvious that miracles can never teach you which religion is true. Miracles can show you that there's a God in the world. Miracles can tell you that there is God in the world. But miracles cannot tell you which religion is true. When we go back to the Christian Bible, let's just think for a few more moments. These are the only stories that tell us about the miracles of Jesus. The only source is the Christian Bible. What we don't have is any outside corroboration, any outside substantiation. So, for example, there are no historical sources. You know, there were historians that wrote 2,000 years ago. There were people who wrote history books like Josephus, or there were Roman historians. There's no source outside of the Christian Bible that documents these miracles that Jesus did. Another question, how reliable is the Christian Bible? How reliable is the Christian Bible? For example, the Christian Bible says that when Jesus was put on the cross, when Jesus was crucified, the graves of many righteous people in Jerusalem opened up and these righteous people came out of their graves, they walked around Jerusalem 
and appeared to many people. And that's an amazing, amazing story. This is in the Christian Bible. The Christian Bible is saying that when Jesus was killed, the graves of many righteous Jews were opened. These Jews came out of the graves, walked around, and appeared to many people. Now, I would think, I would think, that if that really happened, would that be a big news story? Would that be a very, very uh, big story that everybody would be talking about? I mean, it would be amazing. Hey, there's my rabbi from when I grew up, and there's my great grandfather. I mean, the people would, it's amazing. And yet, there isn't any place that discusses this miracle outside of that one book in the Christian Bible. As a matter of fact, none of the other books in the Christian Bible talk about this miracle. Only one. But there are three other biographies of Jesus in the Christian Bible. No one else mentions it. It's not in any Jewish sources. It's not in any Roman sources. So I ask myself, do I really believe that that happened? <laughs> Another example. In the Christian Bible it says that when Jesus was born, when Jesus was born, the ruler at that time was someone named Herod. Herod was the ruler. And he got very nervous when he was told that Jesus was born because he was told that Jesus is going to be the Jewish Messiah. So the Christian Bible says that when Herod heard this, he sent soldiers and killed every Jewish baby boy under the age of two in the city of Beit Lechem, and all the surrounding cities. Because he wanted to make sure he killed this baby. And he didn't know which baby it was, so he killed all the Jewish baby boys under the age of two. Now, again, I'll ask you, if that really happened, would that be a big news story? That the Roman, that this, this King Herod, he killed all the Jewish babies in this city and all the surrounding cities under the age of two? That would be horrible. Of course we would know about that story. And yet, no one else discusses that story except for one book in the Christian Bible. It's not in the Talmud. It's not in Jewish history books. It's not in Roman history books. So I would say, I don't really have a lot of trust in the Christian Bible. One more example, and there are many, but one more example. When Jesus was put on trial, he's about 30 years old, he's put on trial, and the Roman ruler who puts him on trial, his name is Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. The Christian Bible says that Pontius Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus. He thought that Jesus was doing nothing wrong. Now the truth is that Jesus was claiming to be the king of the Jews. That was a rebellion against the Romans. That's the kind of thing where the Romans would kill you in two seconds. And yet the Christian Bible says that Pontius Pilate did not want to punish Jesus. He wanted to let him go. Why did he end up executing Jesus? Because it says in the Christian Bible, the Jewish mobs, all the Jewish people, pressured him. We, the Jews, forced him into doing it. So you get the impression that this Roman was very sweet, very nice, wouldn't harm a hair on the head of anyone, but those mean, horrible, disgusting Jews, they forced him. The problem is, 
that there are outside sources that speak about this Pontius Pilate. He is written about in Roman sources, and he is written about in Jewish sources. And we know he was the most violent and vicious and brutal ruler that the Jewish people had in Israel. So we have here a contradiction. The Christian Bible says he was a nice guy. All the other sources say he was a brutal person who killed Jews left and right. As a matter of fact, the Roman sources tell us he was so brutal that the Romans themselves took him out of Israel and brought him back to Rome because he conducted so many atrocities against the Jews. So we have many reasons for doubting the accuracy of the Christian Bible. Now I want to discuss one more question before we end for tonight. And this is a very serious question. If Jesus was not the Messiah, so how is it that so many people believe in him? The truth is that for most of Christian history, people believed in him because that's how they were raised. Most people in the world, if you try to figure out why they are, the religion that they are, it's because that's how they were raised. But the real question is, how about 2,000 years ago, when Jesus had a small group in Israel, they thought he was the Messiah, they thought at least he would become the Messiah, and they see that he is killed on the cross. He is executed. It's interesting, what did Jesus say when he was hung up on the cross? So the Christian Bible says that Jesus screamed out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus said. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It sounds like Jesus is realizing that he failed. He's realizing something went horribly wrong. He understood that he didn't come to be killed. He understood that he came to bring in a better world. He understood that he was supposed to be the king that would make the world a better place, that would let the Jewish people have their own land, and he died. So he understood he's not the Messiah. But what about all those people who followed him? How could they continue to believe in him if it was obvious that he wasn't the Messiah? So I'm going to share with you a few stories. And listen very carefully because these are very interesting stories. In the year 1648, how many years ago was that? Almost 400. That's it? No, 1648. So it's almost 400 years? Roughly. Okay. So almost 400 years ago, or about 400 years ago, right? Just to give you a general frame of reference, right? The Jewish people were scattered all over the world, right? They were not living, most of them were not living in Israel. Many of them were living in Europe and parts of Asia. There was a Christian named Bogdan Chemelnitsky. I probably can't spell it either. 
Anyway, this, he was a Cossack. He was a very, very violent man. And he conducted a pogrom, a massacre, of about 100,000 Jews he butchered, he killed. So the Jews were very much traumatized by this pogrom. It was a horrible, horrible time in Jewish history. There were some people who predicted that the Messiah would come in the year 1648. 1648. Well, guess what happened in the year 1648? <laughs> there was a man named Shabbatai Tzvi. Shabbatai Tzvi. A brilliant man, a brilliant Torah scholar, and he claimed to be the Messiah. Now don't forget, the Jewish people were shaking. They were hoping that someone would help them. Someone would make the world a better place. And people were predicting that this is the year it's going to happen. So in 1648, this man says, I'm the Messiah. And you should know that many, many, many Jewish people followed him. Now what did it mean? He was living in Turkey. What did it mean that people followed him? So what it meant was that they thought he's going to take them all back to Israel because that's what the Messiah is supposed to do. And what many of them did was they sold their homes or they sold their possessions and they were getting ready, they were preparing to go back to Israel with Shabtai Tzvi. However, the Islamic government, Turkey was ruled by Muslims, they threw him into prison, and they gave him a choice. They said, either you convert to Islam, or we kill you. And in 1666, in the year 16, 66, he converted to Islam. What happened to all those people who thought he was the Messiah? Do you still think he's the Messiah? Well, obviously, many people realized, uh-oh, we made a bad mistake. We were wrong. But you have to appreciate, many Jewish people had put all of their hope in this man. They put all their hope in him. So when he converted to Islam, it was very difficult for them to say we were wrong. So many of them believed that the man who is in prison is not the real Shabtai Tzvi. They thought that the real Shabtai Tzvi went up to heaven. The one in prison was a double. And that the real one was going to come down from heaven soon to redeem us, to bring us back to Israel. That's what many of them believed. That's story number one. Story number two. <laughs> In the United States, I believe in the 1950s, so maybe only about 60 years ago, not that long ago, there was a woman who was a channeler. A channeler was someone who claimed that they were able to receive messages from outer space, usually from some alien or some extraterrestrial, or some spirit in outer space. And this woman claimed that there was a spirit that spoke to her, that she would take her pen and hold it over the paper, and the spirit would move her hand, and it would write messages. 
she claimed that the message that she was receiving was that the entire world would be destroyed by a flood on a certain day. She attracted a number of followers. These followers tried to spread her message. There was a professor, a psychologist, who wanted to study this group. He wanted to see what will happen when that day comes and there's no flood, right? Obviously, there was no flood 60 years ago that destroyed the whole world. We're still here. But he wanted to see what would happen because this woman made this prediction and the whole group that gathered around her was based upon her giving them true prophecy. What they discovered was, when that date came, and it passed, and there was no flood, the members of the group did not leave the group. They became even more aggressive in trying to bring people into the group. They became more dedicated to the group, not less dedicated. Very strange. One more story. In the 1970s, only 40 years ago, there was a Christian minister in New York who had a very strange message for his church. Very strange message. He told his church, if you want to be good Christians, you must begin to live like very orthodox Jews, very religious Jews. So he told them. He said, you have to wear a kippah. You have to wear a beard. You have to wear tzitzit. You have to get a brit milah. You have to get circumcised. You have to keep kosher. You have to keep Shabbat and all the holidays. And that's what happened. His entire church became very, very Torah observant. Yeah. They began calling him Abba, the Hebrew word for father. They called him Abba. And you should know that he attracted many Jewish people became part of this church. Many Jewish people became part of this church. Anyway, to make a long story very short, they discovered this man was doing terrible things. He was molesting little boys in the group, and they discovered that he was lying. Now what do you do if you're a member of this group? People had spent 10 years in this church. They invested all of their energy to be part of this group. And now they find out the leader is a very bad man. Do you just leave and say that our whole life was a joke? Well, some people did. Many people left. But many people stayed. And they came up with very strange explanations of his behavior. They tried to rationalize, explain how what he was doing was really a mitzvah. It was a good thing. Now I just shared with you three stories where people believe in something. It, it's very obvious that what they believed is wrong, but they had a very difficult time admitting that it wasn't true. Now, many of you know about Sigmund Freud famous the doctor, Freud. And he once said, when it comes to self-deception, every person is a genius. When it comes to deceiving ourselves, every person is a genius. And so,
there's an idea that when people believe in something very deeply, and it turns out that what they believe is not true, they have a very difficult time giving up their belief. So in the same way that the followers of Shap Tait Svi still believed in him after he converted to Islam, and the followers of this channeler, many of them still followed her after her predictions did not come true, and the followers of this Christian minister, many of them, still follow him after it was discovered that he was doing horrible things, so too, many of the followers of Jesus had a very difficult time admitting that they were mistaken in following him. try to understand one more piece. We understand now how it was possible for people who witnessed the death of Jesus to still believe in him and come up with again this explanation. They said, okay, he died, but he'll come back. But how did this movement spread to become the biggest religion in the world? How did it spread to become the biggest religion in the world? So let's share a few reasons. You should know that for the first 300 years, Christianity was not a very successful movement. It wasn't that big. But around 300 years later, there was the emperor of the Roman Empire, was named Constantine. Constantine had a mother who became a Christian. Constantine was going to fight a big battle. And he had a dream that if his army would fight under the sign of the cross, he would be victorious. He would win. And that's what happened. He, his soldiers marched with crosses on their shields, and they won the battle. And so Constantine decided that his entire empire, he would unite them under the banner of Christianity. So what happened at one point in history was that the ruler of the entire world, basically, that was the entire known world, he told everyone, now the official state religion will be Christianity. So Christianity got off to a very big head start about 300 years after it, was, it began. I want to share one more observation. Since that time, how did Christianity spread? It spread mainly over the past 1700 years, mainly by force. Christians, a while ago, many years ago, came, let's say, from Europe to North America and they told people that you have to become Christians. They didn't give people a choice. So for much of Christian history, people were either given a sword or a cross. And they were told, you kiss the cross or the sword will kiss you. That's how, for many, many, many years, Christianity spread. But the Rambam, Maimonides, one of our great rabbis, Moses Maimonides, 
offered another reason to explain why maybe, he doesn't know for sure, but why maybe did Christianity spread? So he said that we know that when the Mashiach finally comes, the whole world will accept him. The Rambam said, if the Mashiach came to a world where the whole world was pagan, the whole world were pagans, they didn't believe in God, they wouldn't even know what the Mashiach was. So the Rambam suggests maybe the reason that God allowed Christianity and Islam to spread to the entire world, because today most of the world is either Christian or Muslim, the Rambam said that what happened with this was that Jewish ideas are being spread to the entire world. That now, the entire world knows about the Torah. Now the entire world knows about the concept of the Messiah. The entire world believes, they think they believe, in the God that created the world. And now, when the Messiah finally comes, they'll be able to understand, oh, now we understand that's the real Messiah. So the Rambam says maybe that explains why God allowed the success of Christianity and Islam. Okay, that's the uh, program for tonight. And if there are any questions, uh, I think you had a question. And if there are any other questions, uh, we'll take them now. Um, you said that there were no sources outside of the Christian sources that verified miracles. But isn't that the same for Judaism? I mean, where is the verification for the splitting of the Red Sea, the giving of the Torah, what happened in Egypt? What do you say to that? Well, the... I'll repeat the question. You don't see it. No? Please repeat oh. it for the sake of the... So the question was that um, we mentioned in the class that there are no outside sources verifying the miracles that took place in the Christian Bible. And the question was, are there any outside sources verifying the miracles of the Jewish Bible? So the answer is as follows. The real question is, is there any reason for us to believe the accounts of these books? Meaning, the, the core story, the core story of Judaism is that God revealed himself to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. Now, how do we know that that story happened? So there's two possibilities. Possibility number one is that Moses came down from Mount Sinai and claimed that God spoke to him. That's possibility number one. That's basically what happened in Christianity. And, is, and in, in, Islam? Let me finish answering the question. And Islam. In Islam and in Christianity and all other religions, uh, for example, Muhammad claims that God spoke to him through the angel Gabriel. Paul claims that... And he claims that Jesus, so the spirit of Jesus spoke to him. 
right? He's assuming that Jesus is God, or whatever. But again, whatever the claim is, it's Paul claiming that he received the message. Um, the other writers of the Christian Bible, Matthew, right, claims, <coughs> Matthew's not claiming he made up these uh, stories, Matthew's claiming that he's speaking as a prophet on behalf of God. So all religions basically begin where an individual claims, they claim that God spoke to them. Okay. The difference is that in Judaism, it wasn't simply Moses claiming that God spoke to him. The Jewish narrative is that every single Jew at Mount Sinai heard God speak to Moses. Now, if it didn't happen, if it didn't happen, then when the book was written and people read it and it says that your ancestors, because that's the story that's written, that every Jew heard God speak at Mount Sinai, you see, again, it would have been simpler if the book just said that God spoke to Moses and Moses convinced everyone. But the book says every person heard God speak. So again, if it didn't happen, if that didn't happen, so when the story was finally written and people are reading it, they're going to say, wait, God spoke to my ancestors? Well, if that really happened... Why haven't I heard of it before? I mean that if people really did hear God speak at Mount Sinai, they would have told their children. They would have said, guess what happened to me? Right? I mean, look, we tell our children much smaller things than that. Right? You know, we uh, see a beautiful sunset or a, a rainbow, and we want to rush and tell everybody. So if someone was standing at Mount Sinai, and they actually heard God speak, they wouldn't just never tell their children. So, the problem is, if this story did not happen, but the writers say that it happened, the people who are reading this book are going to say, no, it, it, I don't believe it, because if it really happened like that, how come I, I never heard of it before? How come my parents never told me? So, the, the unique thing about the Jewish narrative is that the original revelation was done in public in front of the whole nation. And you cannot fake that, meaning you can't write that if it didn't happen. Because if it didn't happen and you're writing that it happened, it would be challenged. And we know that the Jewish people challenged everything. We would challenge, you know, everything in the world we question. So the Jewish people, though, never questioned whether God spoke to them at Mount Sinai. And what's interesting is that this story is so firm. This story has, we call in journalism, legs, that all of Christianity and all of Islam accept that story as well. No one in the world questions whether or not God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai. So... I think, comparatively speaking, the foundation of Judaism is much, much different than the foundation of Christianity. Again, to review, the foundation of Christianity rests upon the testimony of one person. It's one person, either Paul or Matthew or Mark or Luke, claiming that God spoke to them and told them to write these words. The Jewish narrative is not just Moses claiming that he heard from God. It's an entire nation that heard from God. Therefore, when I read the Christian Bible, I'm reading a book that I don't have much reason to trust. Because again, it's written by individuals who simply make the claim that God spoke to them. But here, when I read the Jewish Bible... I have a lot of reason to trust what it says. So I'm not that concerned that the Egyptians didn't also write about the ten plagues. I'm not that concerned about it. 
because I have a very, very strong reason for accepting the story as written in the Jewish Bible. The second answer to your question is that archaeologists now are actually finding uh, some evidence to corroborate the stories in the Jewish Bible. We have a Torontonian that used to live here and now lives in Israel, Simcha Yakubovich, that did a film that tries to demonstrate some of the archaeological evidence for uh, some of the stories, at least, in the Tanakh. But again, I would, I would emphasize that we as Jews don't need that. Um, a second thing to think about is that at the time that the Jewish biblical miracles happened, who else would have known about it? The Egyptians, let's say. Is it surprising that the Egyptians would not write about these incredible defeats? We understand possibly why Egyptians wouldn't write about these stories. But at the time of Jesus, there were many people who should have had no problem writing about what he may have done. So I think that the, the, the stories are very, very different in terms of um, expecting outside corroboration and secondly, whether we need outside corroboration. Any other questions? Yes? This fellow you're at. Which, which person? Jesus and God. Jesus is God for the Christians? Is Jesus God for the Christians? We don't believe he was God for anyone, but... But for the Christians? Christ, no, not... I'll, I'll make it clear. Christians... They believe Jesus was God, meaning that Christians believe that God took on human form in this person called Jesus. So Christians believe Christians believe that he was God. We as Jews do not believe he was God in any shape or form whatsoever. We believe he was just a human being. But what about Mashiach and confusion and God and Messiah? I'm not trying to understand the question. Christians believe that Jesus is Messiah. Right. And God? How is this possible? Let's, to answer your question, let's separate the issues, okay? The first thing we discussed is, was Jesus the Messiah? Okay. We understand, hopefully, that he wasn't. Right? We understand why he wasn't and why the Christians who believe he is the Messiah, why they are wrong. That should be the first step. Okay? Now, we also understand, even though they're wrong, we understand why it's difficult for them to admit that they're wrong. We understand why it was difficult for them to admit that they had made a mistake. And I'll give you a, a interesting uh, example. Did you ever have an argument with someone, a fight with a friend, and you're arguing back and forth, and back and forth, and you sort of, you know that you're wrong, but you have a very, very difficult time admitting that you're wrong? Right, does that ever happen? <laughs> well, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's very common that we are stubborn and we have a very difficult time admitting either to ourselves or to other people that we were wrong. Now, the second part of your question. How did it happen? How did it happen 
that Christians came to believe that this man named Jesus was God. How did that happen? So, we don't really know, but I can suggest two possibilities. Maybe three possibilities. <laughs> Possibility number one. Jesus lived in Israel, dealt only with Jews. The Jews understood that Jesus was not the Messiah. That really should have been the end of the story. But Paul, a very important person, in the history of Christianity, Paul was a person who never met Jesus, never met him. He was not one of Jesus' students, but he claimed that Jesus came to him in a vision, that Jesus appeared to him in a vision, and that Jesus told him, become my follower. Paul realized that the Jewish people don't accept Jesus. So Paul said, since the Jewish people don't accept Jesus, Paul said, I am going to the Gentiles. That's what Paul says. I will preach to the Gentiles. So Paul does not go around Israel preaching about Jesus. Paul goes outside of Israel, preaching in the southern Europe and parts of Asia, Greece, Turkey, those areas, mainly to non-Jews, mainly to non-Jews, that they should believe in Jesus. Now, how did he speak about Jesus to these non-Jews? He spoke about Jesus in very lofty terms. If he used the expression Messiah, these non-Jews didn't really know what the Messiah was. And Paul would speak about Jesus as being a very, very, almost like an angel, like a divine being. And so one thing that happened was, because Paul was speaking basically to a non-Jewish audience, and these were people who didn't have a concept of one God. We have to appreciate 2,000 years ago, the non-Jewish world were pagans. They worshipped rocks and trees and animals and the stars. And in the ancient world, the Roman world, they believed that there were many gods. For example, the Romans thought that each of the emperors was God. So back then you have to appreciate that non-Jews would have very little problem looking at any ruler and saying, that's God. So when Paul was telling them, this is the Messiah, this is a very great person, one thing that may have happened is that the audience, Paul's audience, may have just assumed that he must be a God. The second problem, maybe that would lead them to believe this, Well, you know, I, I'm not going to, no, that's all we're going to say, because the next thing we'll discuss in two weeks, so we'll leave that for now. But that, I would say, is more or less what happened. Uh, let me give you maybe a good parallel. Listen carefully. Throughout its history, when Christianity spread throughout the world, what would often happen was that Christianity would encounter 
a culture that had its own beliefs. For example, when Christianity went to Africa. So many Christians in Africa, even today, combined Christianity with their ancient pagan practices of ancestor worship. For example, it's very common in parts of Africa that people worship their ancestors. That's not part of Christianity. But because it was so much, so much a part of their worldview, so when they accepted Christianity, they made a chillant. They took Christianity, they took their old beliefs, and they put them all together. Now they have this form of Christianity. And when, for example, Catholicism came to countries that practiced, I hope you'll be able to say this, voodoo, there's a, a practice called voodoo, It's like a form of uh, witchcraft, maybe. So, the Christianity that spread in areas like this formed a religion called Santeria. And Santeria is basically a combination of Christianity and voodoo. So that's more or less what happened when Paul was spreading his Christian ideas. He was spreading it to people who were very used to believing in many, many gods. And that in their worldview, the emperor or the ruler was God. So for them to see Jesus as God was quite natural. It wasn't that strange. Okay. Does that answer your question? That's so so he said? Okay. Yes. I, I, I understand that Pontius Pilate was a bad man, uh, evil, but why would the Christian writers have the Jews also, why would they typecast the Jews as baying for the blood of Jesus? Um, is that is that an agenda point, or is there truth to that? So the question is, um, if the Jewish people were not really responsible for the death of Jesus, why would the writers of the Christian Bible? go out of their way to blame the Jewish people? So the answer is actually very simple. The Jewish people were a small minority in the world. And the Christian Bible was written after, or at least much of it was writ written, after the temple was destroyed. At least the stories of the life of Jesus were all written after the temple was destroyed. And it's at a point where a separation between Christianity and Judaism is emerging. The two religions are beginning to split apart. Because originally, all the followers of Jesus were part of the Jewish community. But once the temple was destroyed, Paul had been already working for about 20 years converting non-Jews. And most of the success of spreading Christianity was among non-Jews. Among Jewish people, it was really totally uh, over. It was finished. So the authors of the Christian Bible have an agenda, their, their effort on some level is to make Christianity more attractive to the non-Jewish world. And one of the ways in which it's, this is done is by shifting the blame for the death of Jesus away from the Romans onto the Jews. Meaning that the real story of Jesus and his execution was that he was a Jew 
claiming to be the king of the Jews. The Romans considered that to be a rebellion. The Romans would kill any rebel. So the Romans executed him. The Romans crucified him. So if the Romans are the bad guys in this story, it's going to be difficult to sell this to the Romans. The Romans didn't have any particular love for the Jews. So what happens in the writing of the stories is that the responsibility for the death of Jesus is shifted away from the Romans and it's placed upon the Jews. The whole Jesus story becomes a fight between the Jewish community and Jesus. And the Jewish community are the bad guys. That's really why that takes place. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, last, I promise. Last That's okay. Time. What, what? These what, guys have all night. No, no, I think they're tired. I don't want to bother them all night. What, what, what was the name of the leader in New York? Jack um, Hickman. Hickman, thank you. Hickman, Hickman. Okay. okay. Lila Tove. Oh, that's right. <laughs>